Now you can put your glasses back on, and I'm assuming if you have glasses, then there must be something wrong with your eyes. I'm assuming that your eyes are out of focus, they're completely blurry, but your glasses are something your doctor gave you to fix your vision, to bring it back to a perfect 2020. But that's at least what they're supposed to do. That's what I call corrective lenses. So that's going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to be talking about vision. What you see is what you get. If you've got a blurred vision, you can't see. But if you've got your corrective lenses on, you got your glasses on, you can see just fine. You can see what's right in front of you. Now, I don't have that bad of vision, but if I take off my glasses, I can't make out details very well. We have an offspring guy at the house for our cable, and I cannot read the words on that. Some of y'all have a lot of words vision that you can't even see a couple feet in front of you. you know? Like, it was pretty hilarious. I was over at Sean's house uh, several weeks ago. He tried to put his contact in with his broken arm. And uh, I was trying to imagine if he could even see the contact he's trying to put in. But uh, we got some pretty bad vision sometimes, and we can't see where we're going. Our lenses our glasses we have, our contacts, are like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our focuser. The Holy Spirit fits inside of us. Our spirit, when sin came into it, took everything and totally made it out of focus. Sin messed up our spirit altogether. And our spirit, or our sinful nature, totally messes us up. Changes out of focus and it'll totally make us get lost. That's why Christ had to come and search for us because we wandered off like the lost sheep probably because we were blind and couldn't see. We wandered off. But the Holy Spirit takes that and focuses it back by our corrective lenses. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says that Christ is our perfecter or our author. Christ, after we have our lenses on, our Holy Spirit, we can now see Christ before us and we can now follow Christ. We can walk in his footsteps and become more like Christ now that we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit allows us to become more like Christ. But now that we can see Christ, Christ makes us whole. And we walk behind Christ. Hebrews 12, verse 2, it fully states, it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning like shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're supposed to fix our eyes upon Christ. If we fix our eyes upon Christ, there's several things that we have to do. And the first one is look at our perception of life. Our first one is going to look at our perception of life. Now that sin has messed us up totally, and our vision has been blurred, we have to go back and fix our eyes on Christ and actually see where we are and where we are in our life. We're supposed to be taking on the attitude of Christ, having the mindset of Christ. But to get there, we have to look at several things. And the first one is our perception. How are we perceiving life? So you want to see it. We're going to look in 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 17 to 21. So find out first. Our first point here. And David had just become, this just anointed as king. When we were getting through here, and his brothers knew this. And, but he was not king yet. He was not placed upon the throne yet. But he had been anointed to become the next king after Saul. But David right now was still a shepherd, living out in the field, living with his father Jesse. And Jesse, his father, wanted him to take food to his brothers, his older brothers, which are on the battlefield. So David grabs the food, and he's early in the morning, as soon as dawn breaks, he gets up and he runs up there because he's ready to go. We see real perseverance here. David doesn't wait until noon time to get out there. He's ready to go. So he immediately gets up early in the morning and he gets out there to the battlefield to see his brothers. But David, before he even gets to this point, before he was even anointed as a king, what was his life? His entire life was a field and sheep. His entire life was watching over sheep day in and day out. He either let his life become a day-after-day day routine, or his life can be a day-by-day day new experience. And with Christ, we're supposed to have a day-by-day day new experience. And this is the difference between a relationship with Christ or a religion. A religion does things over and over and over again as a routine. 
This is the difference between a living relationship with Christ and a dead religion. A living relationship with Christ looks at every single day. It takes every day specifically and lives it to its fullest. Today, Christ lives to his fullest. When Christ was living, every day he died. He knew his time was coming, and he was set to die. He lived to die. So he knew his time was coming, and he lived every single day to its fullest. He used every day as a new experience. Same with David. You look at the book of Psalms, and you just it's amazing to see these poems that David wrote. If I was sitting out in a field with a bunch of sheep day in and day out, I don't think I'd be writing poetry. I'd be probably walking in circles going, no Game Boy ever, no stereo stuff to do out here except just watch the sheep. But David's got to do some other stuff out there watching the sheep. God was preparing him for his battle, for his cause, for his life. We jump forward a little bit, and David's talking to Saul, and David says, I fought the lion. I fought the bear. David was being prepared for what was to come. God was preparing him for what was to come. So his life as a shepherd was preparing him for his next season in his life. And that's what God is doing to us right now. But we've got to live today to the fullest to move on to the next. God's not going to send us into what he has for us until we're prepared right now. He's not going to send us into the next season of our life until we're prepared for it. He's not going to send us into something we're not ready for. He's not going to send us into our ministry or whatever he has for our life until we're ready for it. Day after day of season is what David could have left getting down. But he lived to a day by day new experience. What are things in our life that we can let become a routine? They need to be a new experience. School can be a routine day after day after day after day after day, or it can be a new experience day after day, or day by day. Day by day is different from day after day. Just the attitude you say it is is a whole difference there. Day after day puts in a whole different data attitude, but if you're saying then if you're saying day by day, I'm living day by day. Because if you're living day by day, you're getting ready for something to come. That's what Christ is doing. I was going to go see the Passion again this afternoon. It's my second time to see it. Y'all can go see it three times or more. But I really enjoyed it again because I got to see Christ in his life. He knew he was going to die. He knew he was coming to die. But he still lived every day to its fullest to prepare for that day to come. And remember when Christ was being beat, one of the things he said, he says, my heart is ready. He was ready to take on what was about to come. And the question is, are we going to be ready when our Goliath comes into our life to take it on? When God sends that big time into our life, are we going to be ready to tackle it? Or have we not lived the days like God wanted us to? Have we not opened our lives like David did and accepted what God gave us? When David got to the battle in 1 Samuel 17, 22, it says he literally dropped everything. He literally dropped everything and ran to meet his brother. We can tie this into the church. When we come to church, literally, we should be willing, we should be excited to be here. We should, we should literally want to run to get here like David did. When he saw his brothers again, David probably had saw his brothers a couple weeks before, maybe the week before, you know, he might have visited the battlefield pretty often and brought them food. But David, when he, when he got to the battlefield, he was so excited to see his brother that he literally dropped everything where it was and ran to see his brother. He was prepared for the battle. He was prepared to meet his brother. So when we come, we should be excited to see one another. We should be excited to see our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we don't get to see them as often as we want to. We should want to see them every day. Because we're supposed to be you know, friends. We're, we're family. We're blood relatives. So we should want to see each other every day. And that's what David did. He literally ran to meet his brother. That was the perception that David had of his life. That's the perception that he had of the people in his life. He was excited. But another perception, and this comes from his brother Eliab. His brother Eliab, if you notice, Eliab was a fight starter. Eliab was jealous of David. 
in verse 28, David gets to the battle, and he's hanging around talking to everyone. And David's having a funny time until Eliab comes up. And Eliab comes up and just starts a fight with David. He's like, what are you doing here? You're coming here to make us look bad. And he's going on and on and on. And Eliab was being a booger. He wasn't being a believer. There's a difference between a believer and a booger. A booger comes to church to start a fight. A believer comes to church to believe in God, to accept his brothers and sisters in Christ. Eliab was jealous. That was Eliab's thinking. He was jealous because David was going to become king, and he wasn't. Eliab was out on the battlefield, scared, hiding in a tent because of Goliath. And David was all happy going, hey, what can I do? What can I do? <coughs> Eliab was jealous of David. <coughs> we can find a little bit more about a booger in Revelation chapter 3. Christ writes letters to different churches. In Revelation chapter 3, he writes a phrase. And he says, you're either hot or you're cold, but you're lukewarm. You stop growing. You're not on fire for me. And you're either cold, which means you don't even know me, but you're right in the middle. You're lukewarm, you've known me, but you're producing no fruit. That's also in John chapter 15. Christ tells us, if you're part of the body, then you have to produce fruit. And there's no fruit being produced. When we don't grow in Christ, we become stagnant, and instead become self-centered again. We go into that fallen nature. One of the first things that Christ tells us to do when we accept him is deny ourselves. Deny ourselves. Get rid of that old nature. Throw it out the back door and he says literally crucify it. That sinful nature that's inside of us that fights against us really feel to throw it behind it and nail it to the back door so it doesn't come back. And leave it there and don't go back. Where's that relationship with God? Where's that relationship with Christ? 
If we have a relationship with our mother or with our father, and someone does that to them, and we get angered by it, and want to step up for them and say something, but we don't feel anything to step up before Christ, where's the relationship? David had the relationship with God. That's why he's called a man after God's own heart. He had the attitude of God. He had the attitude of what Christ was going to be. Christ saw his cause, and he did it. David saw his cause, and he stood for it. He was a man of God. I'm going to continue on. David lived for God. We are supposed to be living for Christ. Our life has to reflect Christ's life. Our life needs to reflect Christ's life so that when people look at us, people see Christ and want to be drawn to Christ. And that has to be in a follower of Christ. That was one of the main things about a follower of Christ. is that we are supposed to reflect in Christ's attitude, in Christ's life.
possible things that is what God is looking for us to do. The possible things are the things that everybody does. But it's the impossible things that God is asking you to step out upon. When the airplane, before the airplane was invented, nobody thought we could fly. Thought it was pretty silly. So somebody goes to fly the airplane, the impossible became possible. And many other things, before the telephone, or the internet, or maybe some microwaves, the impossible became the possible. Before it's done, we look at it and say, this cannot be done. Now maybe one day we'll have a transport, like on Star Trek, where we'll beam ourselves up or something like that. That's the impossible right now. But God wants us to dream big. A man without a dream is a man in trouble. We've got to dream the impossible because God works the impossible. We've got to see our call for Christ, and then through that, God will work through us as long as we stand in faith with Him. We just got to trust in God. If we want to do something, then we just need to talk to God and say, Are you with me on this? And God will call us. God will call us to go forward. We've got to understand and get the perception that life is not just a humdrum deal that we go through, but it's a new experience. We've got to get the perception that a real believer in Christ sees the church as a place to be built up and encourage one another. And it's not known for a place where arguments and disunity exist. Because unity is the church. Love is the church. We are the church. When we leave the building, we don't stop being the church. This building is not the church. We are the church. We don't come to church. We are the church wherever we go. And we walk into Walmart. Walmart becomes our church. <laughs> because we are in Walmart. We are the church. We ourselves are the church. The church, if you go into Sam's Club, the church is in Sam's Club. Because you are the church. Wherever you go, you are the church because you're a part of the body of Christ. When we were at the hospital because of Sean's arm, there was a little girl, and probably don't think I remember this, there was a little girl that was growing up, and Sharon goes over there and holds her hair back and braids it so they get out of her face. That is a sign of serving someone else. Even though it might have been gross in that circumstance, she still went over there and served. That's a sign of service. The hand of Christ reaching out. Don't doubt the power of God in yourself. Because God is dwelling inside you. The Holy Spirit inside you, don't doubt it. Just look for God to work in your life. What you see is what you get. If you see a dead church, the church is going to be dead. Perception. If you see your life as a routine, it's going to be routine. If you see God not being able to work the impossible, then he's not going to be able to work 